All right, so this is chapter 14. We're going to talk about gene expression from the gene to the protein. This meets the course objective, explain the molecular basis of protein synthesis. I crossed out the DNA replication part, not because you don't need to know that, but we're not talking about that in this, um, in this lecture. So we're gonna talk about the central dogma of biology. Um, we'll talk more about genes, coding for proteins. We'll talk about transcription then translation, kind of on the big picture side of things. Um, we'll talk about the flow of information in prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms, the genetic code, and then we'll get into transcription in more detail um, and translation in more detail, and then mutations. So the definition of what a gene is has kind of changed over time. We could say a gene is a discrete unit of inheritance, and we talked about that when we talked about Punnett squares. Um, or we could say a gene is a specific nucleotide sequence um, in or on a chromosome. Or we could say a DNA sequence um, that codes for a specific polypeptide chain um, would be a gene. Remember, what's a polypeptide? So poly is many, and then peptide bonds are the kind of bonds that happen between amino acids. So a polypeptide chain is just a chain of amino acids. Um, and if we fold that up, um, we can get um, a functional protein. Um, and then we could also say that a gene is a region of DNA that can be expressed to produce a final functional product, either a polypeptide or an RNA molecule. So that last one is kind of the most um, thorough definition of what a gene is but they all have their you know, strengths and weaknesses. So the information that's stored in genes as sequences of nucleotides and DNA is going to dictate the synthesis of proteins. And since proteins have a specific role in a cell, that information that's stored in um, genes um, is going to lead to specific traits in an organism. Um, so protein is really the link between the genotype and the phenotype of an organism. Remember the genotype is their genetic makeup and their phenotype is their uh, physical characteristics. Um, so gene expression then can be seen in the proteins an organism produces um, and the process by which DNA um, directs protein synthesis has two stages, transcription and then translation. So these are both T words and oftentimes students get them kind of confused, but um, transcription happens before translation. And the way I remembered this when I was a student is I would think that translation happens later because of, I guess, the L, right? So hopefully that helps. Um, so oftentimes my students confuse DNA replication and protein synthesis. Um, so. I mean, I see why, but if we just look at the words DNA replication, DNA replication is replicating the DNA. So it's using a DNA template to make a strand of DNA. And then protein synthesis is to synthesize a protein. So this uses a DNA template to make a strand of mRNA, and then that mRNA is used to make a protein. So if we were thinking about, um, you know, recipes, um, maybe your grandma or your mom or somebody you know has like a recipe card holder with recipe cards and they make um, some really awesome pancakes. So if you wanted to get the instructions for the pancakes from your mom or your grandma or whoever, you'd copy down their little recipe card onto your own little recipe card to put in your recipe file. Um, so that's like DNA replication. You're taking the instructions and writing another copy of the instructions. Um, protein synthesis, on the other hand, is when you actually um, read the recipe, right? Make the pancake batter and then cook the pancakes. So you get the product that the instructions code for with protein synthesis. Um, and this really describes the central dogma of biology. So going from DNA to RNA to protein. Um, do you think that's important? It's called the central dogma. So I would say it's a pretty big deal. So the central dogma of biology includes transcription and translation. In transcription, the big picture here is that RNA polymerase uses a DNA template to make mRNA. And then with translation, um, this is when that mRNA is going to be used to synthesize a specific polypeptide um, on a ribosome using, again, that mRNA template. So to go from DNA to RNA, that is transcription. And then to go from RNA to protein, that is translation. And again, this is something people often confuse. They're both two T words. Um, and you know, this is a big deal on the test because if you mix those up, you'll keep making the mistake again and again. So it's worth taking a moment to make sure you get the difference between 
transcription and translation. Um, and really, RNA is that kind of bridge between the, D the instructions on the DNA and a new protein produced with protein synthesis. So here we've just got a picture of um, transcription and translation in both a bacterial cell, so a prokaryotic organism, and then a eukaryotic cell, so a eukaryotic organism. Um, so transcription and translation um, are not separated by the nucleus in bacteria because there's not a nucleus. However, um, eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, so transcription happens in um, the nucleus and then translation happens in the cytoplasm and the RNA is actually processed, which we'll talk more about um, later. So you have actually, you have pre-mRNA and then you have mature mRNA um, with eukaryotic cells. When we talk about DNA in transcription, um, We've got two strands. We've got the template or anti-sense strand and the non-template, which is sometimes called the coding or sense strand. Um, on our exam, I'm gonna go with template and non-template because I think those are very um, good descriptive words here. Um, but the other names are appropriate as well and you might run into those in other classes. So the template strand is the strand that's used to make the mRNA and um, the non-template strand is the strand that is not used to make the mRNA. So in our picture here, the template strand is blue and the non-template strand is green and the mRNA is orange. Um, so again, if we look in more detail at describing a strand of DNA and transcription, um, only part of the template strand is going to be used. Unlike in DNA replication where we have to copy that whole strand, we don't have to copy the whole strand here. Um, so the promoter is the region that signals the start of transcription, and the terminator is the region that signals the end of transcription. And then we have a gene in the middle um, between the promoter and the terminator, and that is used to make mRNA. So if we look a little bit deeper at transcription, um, transcription has three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation is when RNA polymerase recognizes the promoter region. You might remember we talked about DNA polymerase in um, DNA replication. Remember what DNA polymerase did? DNA polymerase produced the um, DNA copy, and actually there's a couple different DNA polymerases, but um, either way, RNA polymerase is actually going to make the RNA um, transcript in transcription. So in elongation, that's where RNA polymerase synthesizes the RNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And it uses that template strand. So if the template strand has a C, the new RNA will have an R. <laughs> the new RNA will have a G. There's no R's. Um, if the template strand has a G, the RNA will have a C. If the template strand has a T, the RNA will have an A, and if the template strand has an A, um, the RNA will have a U. Remember, RNA um, doesn't have thiamine, RNA only has uracil, um, so don't get confused there. And then in termination, RNA polymerase reaches the termination sequence, and this causes both the polymerase and the newly made RNA transcript to dissociate or break apart from the DNA. So this picture just shows you um, initiation, elongation, and termination of transcription. Um, again, with RNA polymerase binding, and then RNA polymerase creating the RNA transcript, and then um, RNA polymerase in the RNA transcript detaching. So if we look more into detail on transcription initiation, RNA polymerase has to attach to a promoter sequence upstream of the start point. In eukaryotic organisms, that's a TA-TA box, um, and that's crucial for forming the initiation complex. Um, so transcription factors help RNA polymerase bind to the, um, to the DNA and initiate transcription. So the entire transcription initiation complex is the initiation factors, um, RNA polymerase, and uh, the promoter region. So with elongation, RNA polymerase is actually going to untwist the double helix. It does like 10 to 20 bases at a time, um, and it's also going to lay down nucleotides to build that RNA. Um, and a gene can actually be transcribed simultaneously by several RNA polymerases. So you create more mRNA, and then you know, you're going to create more of those proteins in the cell. So in bacteria, um, termination of 
um, transcription is going to happen when the polymerase stops transcription at the end of the terminator and the mRNA can be translated without further modification. However, in eukaryotic organisms, RNA polymerase is going to transcribe a poly-A signal sequence, um, so we sometimes call that the poly-A tail, and then there has to be RNA processing where the cells modify the RNA after transcription. So when eukaryotic cells modify RNA after transcription, um, the 5' prime end receives a modified um, nucleotide, so you have a 5' prime cap, and you have a poly-A tail on the 3' prime end, and these modifications help facilitate the export of um, mRNA to the cytoplasm. It helps to protect the mRNA from hydrolytic enzymes. Um, what is a hydrolytic enzyme? Remember what hydrolysis is? Um, hydrolysis is adding water in and breaking things apart. So this is saying um, that these modifications help prevent the breakdown of RNA um, and they also help ribosomes attach to the 5' prime end. So it's kind of like those little things on the end of your shoelaces. Um, they're called aglets if you needed a fun fact or if you already knew it and want to pat yourself on the back. Um, either way, um, those little plastic things on the ends of your shoelaces help keep your shoelace um, in good shape longer. Um, and if you ever lose those little ends, your shoelace just starts kind of unraveling quickly there. Um, also, usually some interior parts of the um, RNA molecule are going to be cut out and other parts are going to be spliced together. So that RNA splicing is going to happen in most eukaryotic mRNAs. Most of them have long non-coding stretches. What we mean by a non-coding stretch is that it doesn't code for the amino acids that are going to be found in the final protein. So um, these next two words, introns and exons, are another pair of words that students just regularly get confused. So introns um, are non-coding regions, and they're named because they're intervening sequences. So they're the stuff that doesn't make it into the final product. And then exons are what is, I guess, like going to be exiting from this pre-mRNA into the mature mRNA, and so that is what's going to be translated into the amino acid sequences. And so RNA splicing is the term for removing the introns and joining the exons, um, and it's going to create an inter a mature mRNA molecule with a continuous coding sequence. Um, and so Probably one of my favorite biology words is spliceosome. Um, spliceosomes are the enzymes that help with RNA splicing. You can't really make that up. That's too great. Or I guess somebody made it up. But anyhow, spliceosomes do splicing. So they splice together the exons and the introns are cut out. Um, so many genes can actually give rise to two or more different polypeptides or different proteins depending which segments um, are used as exons. And so this process is called our alternative splicing um, or alternative RNA splicing. And again, the RNA splicing is carried out by spliceosomes. Um, so you can see in the image over here, um, we've got a gene that has four possible exons and we could use exon one, two, and three and get a protein, we'll call it protein A, or we could use exons one, two, and four and get a different protein, we'll call that protein B. Um, so if we look at E. coli, E. coli is the bacterium, and bacterium don't do alternate splicing. Um, so they've got, you know, approximately 4,000 genes and none of them are alternatively spliced. Um, we can look at Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, which is a fungus. Um, thanks, that's yeast. Thanks for the beer and bread, right? Um, so they do less than 1% of their genes are alternatively spliced. Um, and then if we look at um, Homo sapiens, the chart says a complex mammal. Thanks, right? Um, we've got 25,000 genes and um, about 70% of them are alternatively spliced. So that gives us a huge amount of proteins possible. Um, so it's kind of exciting there. So then we can talk about ribozymes. Um, remember before we've talked about enzymes and what kind of molecule did I tell you enzymes were? Right, I told you before that they were proteins, and um, I was probably like, oh, you know, it's kind of a lie, they're not all proteins, but most of them are, so we'll call them proteins for now. 
but ribozymes are RNA molecules that can function as an enzyme. Um, so they function as a catalyst. And so in some organisms, RNA splicing can actually happen without proteins or even additional RNA molecules. Um, so the introns can actually catalyze their own splicing, which is exciting. Um, so what is the purpose of transcription? So transcription goes from DNA to RNA. Um, and then in eukaryotic critters, where does transcription occur? So transcription would occur in the nucleus of eukaryotic organisms. If you're a prokaryotic organism, um, it's not happening in the nucleus, but it's happening on the DNA. So if you said on the DNA, um, I would take that as well. Um, and then what's one enzyme involved in transcription? So what's the enzyme that makes the RNA polymer? That would be RNA polymerase. Um, and then if we use the provided DNA template strain to produce an RNA sequence, um, it would go, it would start at the five prime because it's complementary. So the T would code with um, the A and then the next A would code with U and then the C would code with G and then the two A's would go with U, U and then T with A and G with C and T with A and A with U and G with C and the two C's with two G's and the other end would be the three prime end. So hopefully that helped. So then translation is the RNA directed synthesis of a polypeptide. So we had transcription and now we're at translation. Um, again, I think translation happens later. Um, you know, some people will say like, oh, transcription is when you write it down and translation is when you change the language. But I just, I've never really had that one stick for me. So if it, it sticks for you, then, then good for you. Um, but anyhow, I think translation happens later because you have to have the RNA and then we read the RNA to make the protein in translation. So this requires an mRNA, tRNA, ribosome, and translation factors. Um, and it's got three stages again, initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, and here we need energy, and that energy is provided by the hydrolysis of GTP. Um, GTP is not ATP, um, but it's an energy carrier similar to ATP. So with translation, um, the genetic code is a sequence of bases in an mRNA molecule, and they're read in groups of three nucleotides that are called codons. So like the start codon um, specifies a particular amino acid, which is methionine. Um, it also says to start, um, and the start codon is AUG. So there's those three nucleotides, A, U, and G, and that makes up the start codon. Um, so codons can specify an amino acid. They could say to stop, or they could say to stop. Um, and it's a redundant code, meaning that more than one codon can specify the same amino acid. Um, we'll get to that more coming up here in a second. Um, and if we look at mRNA, mRNA is going to be like kind of red at the ribosome, starting at the start codon and stopping at the stop codon. As far as cracking the genetic code goes, um, of the 64 codons, 61 code for amino acids, and there are three stop signals that end translation. And again, that genetic code is redundant because more than one codon can specify a particular amino acid. It's not going to be ambiguous, so no codon specifies for more than one amino acid. Um, so do not memorize this chart, but do learn how to use it. Um, this is called an mRNA codon dictionary because you're going to look up the codons on mRNA and see what amino acids they code for. Um, we'll see if they can use the pointer here. Ooh, there we go. It does work. Um, so on this chart, it says first position, second position, and third position. So those are the positions of the particular um, amino acid. So if, if we went or sorry, those are the positions of the particular nucleotides, and then it tells you what amino acid those nucleotides code for. I apologize. Um, so the first position, if we're looking at AUG, first position would be A, second position would be U, and third position would be G. So in A, that means it's going to be in this particular row here. The U tells us it's going to be in this column and this row and then really I think by the time we get to here we can just look and see AUG so AUG codes for methionine or start um, if we did 
G, 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 that's kind of a fun one. So G, G, and G. So G, G, G codes for GLY, which is the abbreviation for glycine, but I don't expect that you um, memorize those abbreviations. Um, you'll be able to just write the abbreviation on your exam. So that's how you use that type of mRNA codon dictionary. Um, there's another codon dictionary that I like as well, and some people find this one a little bit easier um, to use. So if we do our two examples we did before, um, we did AUG before, so in this one you start in the middle for your first base, so A would be here, then we'd go to U, and then we'd go to G, which is methionine. So that gives us the same answer, so that's a good sign. Um, the second one we looked up was GGG, so we'd go G, G, and G and get glycine. So again, we got the same answer, so that's that's a good thing there. Um, on your exam, I'll give you both of the different types of codon dictionaries just because some people find one easier to use than the other. So we're still in translation. Um, another part of translation that's important is the tRNA. The tRNA actually brings the amino acids to the ribosome, um, and the tRNA molecule itself is going to be an RNA strand that's about 80 nucleotides long, and it has an anticodon region, which is going to bind to the codon on mRNA, and it also has an acceptor stem that's going to be able to pick up amino acids. Um, so there's a couple different ways, um, you know, the the book depicts tRNA, um, but this first one is a two-dimensional structure, um, and you can see that the um, tRNA molecules are able to um, base pair with themselves to produce this um, kind of 3D shape here. Um, in the next picture, they've got the 3D structure, and then our book's picture, they use this symbol that to me looks like a sock puppet, um, but I mean, that's okay, I suppose. They're really emphasizing the attachment site for the amino acids and also the anticodon, which attaches to the mRNA codons. So the pairing of the tRNA and the amino acids is actually a pretty big deal. Um, so you have to have the correct match between the tRNA and the amino acid in order to get the right protein. Um, and that's done by an enzyme called amino acyl tRNA synthetase. That's a mouthful, right? Um, but anyhow, that helps facilitate the binding of the tRNA to the amino acid. Um, and then we also have to have a correct match between the tRNA anticodon and the mRNA's codon um, in order to get, you know, the right um, amino acid in the protein. So at the ribosome, the ribosome is important for translation because this is really where everything's happening. So the ribosome is made of rRNA, so the R there stands for ribosomal, so ribosomal RNA and protein. Um, and the ribosome also has two subunits. In our class, we're going to call them the small and large subunit. Um, sometimes they're called other things, but small and large is great because there's a big one and there's a little one. Um, so the small and large subunit are going to clamp onto the mRNA, um, and this forms three sites, the A site, where the tRNA with an amino acid is going to enter the large, sub, the large subunit. So the A there stands for amino acid or amino acyl. Um, and then the P site is where the tRNA um, with the amino acid chain is held. This stands for polypeptide. And then the E site is where the tRNA without an amino acid um, is going to exit the ribosome. So E stands for exit. Um, so this picture here has um, all of those sites shown for you. Um, the mRNA is in orange, the tRNA is the like teal sock puppets, and then we've got um, amino acids in purple, and that's building up the polypeptide. There's also a great video. Um, I posted a video for transcription and translation because I think it's important to kind of see this in, you know, 3D um, and in sort of real time. So check those out on our Canvas page. Um, so what's the term for the process that removes introns? Um, it's splicing. And then how could one pre-mRNA code for multiple proteins? Um, that's alternative splicing. And then seven, what are two ways mRNA is processed to increase stability? Um, so the five prime cap and the poly A tail is what I was looking for there. So then um, translation has three stages. It has initiation, elongation, and termination. Um, so in initiation, um, 
that's when the mRNA, the first tRNA, and the ribosome are going to assemble. And elongation, that's going to happen from the start codon to the stop codon. And then termination is going to be um, when the entire complex disassembles, or sorry, disassembles um, at the stop codon, and that will release the completed polypeptide. And again, I would really encourage you to watch the video on it because I think the video makes it make a bit more sense because you're looking at things like as they're happening. And if you can watch the video once and then turn the sound off and explain the video, that'll be a great way to make sure you know what's happening with translation. Um, so again, <laughs> With translation initiation, um, that's going to bring together initiation factors. Um, it's also going to bring together mRNA, tRNA, and the first with the first amino acid, and the large and small ribosomal subunit. Um, the small ribosomal subunit is going to bind with the mRNA and a special initiator tRNA, um, and the small subunit is actually going to move along the mRNA until it reaches the start codon, which is going to be AUG. Um, the start codon is going to establish the reading frame for the mRNA because um, it's read in three nucleotide sequences. Um, and then the large ribosomal subunit is going to be added and it's going to complete the formation of the translation initiation complex. So in this picture, um, you've got um, the small ribosomal subunit, the mRNA, the initiator tRNA that binds to AUG um, and it carries methionine. Um, and then the large ribosomal subunit is going to attach and the um, E, P, and A sites are going to be created. So then in elongation, amino acids are going to be added one by one um, with the help of tRNA. And each addition involves proteins called elongation factors. Um, we have to have codon recognition, then peptide bond formation, and then translocation. Um, and this is going to proceed along the mRNA in the five prime to three prime direction. So if we look at this picture, we've got our mRNA here, that orange strand, you've got the ribosome, kind of looks like a potato um, with the large and small ribosomal subunits with the different sites, the E, the P, and the A site. Um, and when the codon and the tRNAs, anti-codon, um, recognize each other, um, that anti-codon will bind to the codon, and then the peptide bond will have to form between the two amino acids, and then we have to move down um, the mRNA to the next site and the previous tRNA is going to leave. So we're ready um, for the next tRNA to come in. So as far as termination of translation goes, this happens when um, a stop codon in the mRNA reaches the A site on the ribosome. The A site is going to accept a protein called a release factor then, um, which in um, this image is kind of that yellow color, and that release factor is going to cause the addition of water instead of an amino acid, so that releases the polypeptide, um, and then the translation assembly comes apart. Sorry, I'm missing a T there. It says in, but it should say then translation assembly comes apart. Um, so what's the point of translation? So translation goes from mRNA to proteins. And then where does translation occur? Translation occurs on the ribosome. Um, so translation happens on the ribosome in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic critters. And then... Um, If the mRNA codon was uh, GCC, or sorry, let's try that again. If the mRNA codon was CGC, what would the tRNA anticodon be and what would the amino acid be? So I'm going to let you pause that so you can go flip back to your um, mRNA codon um, dictionary and look that up. Okay, so if the mRNA codon was C, G, C, the tRNA anticodon would need to be G, C, G. Um, and then, which one of those would we use to look up the amino acid? Would you look up the mRNA codon or the tRNA anticodon? So you would actually look up the mRNA codon. So on your codon chart, you're going to look up C, G, C, 
So on your codon chart, if you go C, G, C, you get ARG or arginine um, for the amino acid. So it's also important that um, the polypeptide folds properly. So the polypeptide chain can actually um, coil um, and then fold into its three-dimensional shape spontaneously. Um, however, often translation and the spontaneous folding is not sufficient to make a functional protein, and it might require post-translational modifications. Um, so the chain itself could be modified, um, or it could be targeted to a specific part of the cell. So we talked before about free and bound ribosomes. Um, so free ribosomes are in the cytosol and bound ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. And free ribosomes are going to mostly synthesize proteins that actually function in the cytosol. Um, and their synthesis is always going to start in the cytosol and it'll finish in the cytosol unless the polypeptide signals the ribosome to attach to the endoplasmic reticulum. And then it would become a bound ribosome. Um, and so those make proteins that are going to be part of the endomembrane system. Um, and those proteins could also be secreted from the cell. Um, so this has to be marked by a signal peptide. Um, and if that's the case, then a signal recognition particle, or SRP, um, binds to the signal peptide and brings the signal peptide and its ribosome to the endoplasmic reticulum. So here we just have a picture of showing you, um, you know, translation starting in the cytoplasm, um, and then there's a signal recognition particle here. Um, it's going to bind to the signal peptide. Um, then that will bind to a receptor protein on the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, the signal recognition particle will detach, and polypeptide synthesis is going to resume. Um, and then there's a signal cleaving enzyme that can cut off the signal peptide, um, and the completed polypeptide is going to fold into its final conformation um, inside the ER. And from there, it can either be used in the endomembrane system or it can be exported from the cell. And the ribosome goes back to the cytoplasm um, where it will be able to bind to mRNA again, and the mRNA is back in the cytoplasm where it could be used to make another protein. So you can actually make multiple polypeptides um, from a single mRNA. Um, so in bacteria and eukaryotic organisms, multiple ribosomes can actually translate an mRNA at the same time. Um, so you can see in this image here, there's um, several ribosomes attached to the same mRNA kind of moving along there. Um, and as long as the ribosome is far enough past the start codon, another ribosome can attach um, to that mRNA at the start codon. Um, and we can have strings of polyribosomes. So here's a transmission electron micrograph image of that where you can see the ribosomes along a piece of mRNA there. So making multiple mRNAs is a little bit different. Um, so multiple mRNAs can be transcribed from the same gene. Um, and in bacteria, transcription and translation can take place simultaneously. Um, so we've got um, the picture of that happening here, um, where there's a DNA and then there's mRNA being created and then there's even polyribosomes on that. So that um, gene is very active in making a whole bunch of proteins um, from that particular gene. However, it's important to realize that in eukaryotic organisms, the nuclear envelope is going to separate transcription and translation. So in eukaryotic critters, transcription is going to happen in the nuclear or within the nuclear envelope or in the nucleus and translation will happen um, outside of the nucleus. Also, eukaryotic organisms have to um, alter their mRNA before it's ready for translation. Um, so here's just kind of an overview. Um, we've got DNA going to RNA, so that's transcription. Um, and then eukaryotic organisms, they've got RNA processing. So um, they're showing you splicing with getting rid of the introns. They've got a poly A tail on that RNA. They've got a five prime, five prime cap on that mRNA. And the mRNA is um, in the cytoplasm now and it's going to attach to the small ribosomal subunit. Large ribosomal subunit will come in um, and that ribosome like reads the RNA and tRNAs come in, bring amino acids, and we build that polypeptide or protein there. They're also showing you um, up kind of in this corner of the picture um, 
with the amino acetyl tRNA synthetase, I'm adding the amino acid um, to the tRNA, which is an important part as well. So that brings us to a slightly different topic. Um, so we had transcription and we had translation. Um, and now we're going to talk about mutations um, and how they can affect protein structure and function. Um, so a mutation is just a change in the DNA um, in either a cell or a virus. And mutations may or may not be heritable depending on whether they're in the germline or not. And mutations could be good, they could be bad, they could be neutral, they could be nearly neutral. So the way we're going to talk about this is we're going to talk about um, why the mutation happened or how the mutation happened um, and then we're going to ha talk about what happened to the DNA and then we're going to talk about how this affected the resulting protein. So this is a little bit different than the book um, but I just I really like this sort of structure to talk about mutations and I'm not the only one who likes this. This is a pretty common way to talk about them. So we'll talk about why the mutation um, happen, or maybe it'd be better to say how the mutation happened. Um, so mutations can be either spontaneous or induced. When it's basically like the cell's fault, there was some mistake in the biological process, um, we call that spontaneous. So all species have a background mutation rate, um, and that rate's going to vary by species, but roughly we have one mutation for every, you know, million genes, so that's not so bad. Um, however, if the environment somehow causes the mutation, like a chemical or physical agent, um, then it's going to be induced. So these um, DNA damaging agents are called mutagens, um, and we know it was induced if there's a higher rate than spontaneous mutations for that particular species. So let's do a couple reviews here. So number 11, if you have a mistake um, by DNA polymerase that led to a point mutation, you don't know what a point mutation is yet, but you don't, it doesn't matter. You just need to know, was it the cell's fault or was it the environment's fault? So DNA polymerase, that's the cell's fault. Um, so this would be a spontaneous mutation. The next one, we've got ultraviolet radiation produced primidine dimers altering the structure of DNA, um, and then it was copied by polymerase before repair. So is that the cell's fault or the environment's fault? I mean, I guess you could say the cell because you're like, well, polymerase didn't catch it, but it was the environment that damaged the DNA, so this is going to be induced. So wear your, sun your sunscreen, right? Um, so 13, we have transposons that are small segments of an organism's DNA that can be inserted into various sites of the genome. These are sometimes called jumping genes, um, and they can cause mutations if they're inserted into a gene. So this is going to be spontaneous because, again, it's sort of the cell's fault there. Um, then we've got benzopyrene, which is a chemical in cigarette smoke that ultimately causes a distortion in DNA that disrupts the normal DNA synthesis. So that's going to be um, the environment's fault, so that's an induced mutation. So then we can talk about what kind of change happened. Um, so we can get a little bit more complicated than this, but um, the big thing we're going to talk about are point mutations, um, which are a change in just one nucleotide pair of a gene. Um, so like a nucleotide pair substitution would be an example of a point mutation. Um, and this is where we switch one base pair for another. Um, or we can have insertions and deletions, which are additions or losses of the nucleotide pairs in a gene. So an insertion or deletion of nucleotides can alter the reading frame, um, and that can produce a frame shift mutation. So in this next example, um, we lost the third T, so that's both a deletion and a frame shift mutation there. So then we need to know if the protein produced was changed. So in a missense mutation, one amino acid is switched for another. Um, in a nonsense mutation, um, we have an early stop codon, so we get a shorter um, protein. And then in a silent mutation, we have no change to the protein that's produced. Because the genetic code is redundant, so multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. So really when you look at the protein product or you look at the um, like organism itself, it's going to not appear like it even had a mutation. So let's look at a couple examples here. So we've got our original DNA sequence and our mutated DNA sequence. Um, first of all, is this induced or spontaneous? 
That's tricky. I didn't give you enough information to tell. Oh, actually, first of all, we should figure out where the mutation is. So our mutation is right there. And then the second thing, is it induced or spontaneous? I didn't give you enough information. Um, is it a substitution or frame shift? This is going to be a substitution because we substituted a G for a C. Um, and then if it's missense, nonsense, or silent, you're gonna have to go to your codon dictionary and you're gonna have to make the mRNA strand to find that out. So I suggest you pause the video here for a moment and um, give that an attempt. So this is actually a missense mutation. So the next one here, we've got um, our original DNA, mutated DNA, and the mistake is right here. Um, there's an A added in. Um, do you have enough information to tell if this is induced or spontaneous? You do not. Um, can you tell if it's a substitution or frame shift? It's a frame shift because you change the reading frame by adding that um, adenine in there. And then missense, nonsense, or silent. Again, I recommend you pause the video here, um, pull out your mRNA codon dictionary, um, make the mRNA for both the original and mutated DNA, and find out. So this is a nonsense mutation because you have an early stop codon. So then here again, we've got two DNA sequences. Our, um, our what? Our change in the DNA is right there. Instead of a thymine, we have a cytosine. Um, we can't tell if it's induced or spontaneous, um, and this is a substitution. And then with missense, nonsense, or silent, pause the video and come back when you're ready. So this is a silent mutation because both of the amino acid sequences were the same. So for 18 here, where's your DNA alteration? It's right there. So... Um, we lost an adenine, um, so induced or spontaneous, same as before, not enough information. It's not that there's never enough information, but I didn't tell you some sort of story, um, so you wouldn't have enough information for this one. Then substitution or frame shift. Um, well, we changed the entire reading frame, so this is a frame shift mutation, and then missense, nonsense, or silent pause and come back to me. So that's going to be um, a missense mutation um, because we altered the amino acid sequence. Um, so we did a few of those um, problems, so it's definitely worth um, paying attention to that and being able to solve those problems yourself. Um, so then um, not all mutations are passed on to offspring. So if a mutation is a um, somatic mutation, it occurs only in non-germline tissue. Germline tissue is the tissue that produces um, sperm or eggs or produces the um, reproductive cells. So somatic mutations doesn't occur in those tissues, so those are not inherited. Um, the mutation is found only in the tumor. However, we all know that, um, you know, there are um, syndromes and disorders and um, diseases that can be passed on genetically. Um, so a germline mutation is present in the tissues that produce sperm and egg, so that can be inherited and that can cause um, those um, inheritable syndromes. So chapter 14, we looked at gene expression from the gene to the protein, um, and we explained the molecular basis of DNA replication and protein synthesis. And we talked about central dogma, talked about transcription and translation, um, and we talked about um, RNA modification and RNA splicing and mutations and the types of mutations and mutagens.